Hi folks and welcome to the winter webinar series. My name is Kim Gridley. I will be your host today and helping out on the back end with some if we have any technical issues. Uh, we're joined today with, by Gary Gilmore from Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. He's going to be talking to us about charcoal and biochar. You should be able to see his screen now. Um, just for those of you who maybe weren't with us last week, there is a question box. And if you have any questions um, throughout the presentation, don't hesitate to ask them there. And at the end, we'll have a few minutes to um, relay those questions back to Gary. Also, if you would just take a minute to introduce yourself, um, your name and where you're from and your affiliation, if you feel uh, like you'd like to do that, we would really appreciate it. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to pass it over to Susan Richards with the Capital RC&D, and she's going to kind of introduce the program, and then Gary will get started. Great. Well, thank you, Kim, and thank you, Gary, for um, agreeing to be the presenter today, and I'm glad to have everyone here and welcome you to um, this webinar, and it's one of four webinars in a series that has been funded by the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service and thank them very much for their support. And just wanted to say a couple words about Capital RC&D. We're a regional nonprofit organization serving South Central Pennsylvania. Many of our programs are open to a broader range of people in Pennsylvania and um, it, most of our programs are oriented toward private landowners and helping them manage their land uh, to support natural resource um, conservation. And I'd like to welcome you to our website, which is capitalrcd.org. And you'll see a number of videos and other presentations. By the end of this week, we should have the small-scale mushroom production webinar on our website and available and by next week sometime we should have the this webinar on biochar benefits um, and thank you very much and take it away Gary okay is it coming through now okay I started I did a webinar a few years ago and uh, I was talking away and no one could hear me so hopefully that's not the case here all right Charcoal. Gary, we can loud and clear. All right, excellent. Okay, charcoal is an amazing uh, product. I call it a product because it has to be produced. It's not really naturally occurring. And let's see. Let's get my page. Why uh, it's not advancing here. All right, a little technical difficulty here. My slide is not advancing. So let's try that. There we go. Okay. Now, I'm going to be talking about charcoal biochar, and the material of choice I want to talk about is wood. Charcoal can actually be made from coal. It's called coke. You can make it from chicken manure. But for this presentation and for my purposes, I'm going to stick with woody biomass. And this is a piece of pine looked at under underneath a microscope. And the structure, I want to point out how porous a piece of wood is. You think it's solid, but it's extremely porous. And this carries through with the attributes of charcoal when we put it in the soil. So this is a piece of pine. Uh, this is a piece of oak, an extremely hard, dense wood. But here again, very porous at a microscopic scale. And when you take wood and make it into charcoal, these pores still are there. Now we look at the carbon cycle, because it's uh, extremely important for life on this earth. Without it, we couldn't live here but it's the process of taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, combining it with water, H2O, and using photons from the sun through a process called photosynthesis. These two elements, or um, molecules, not molecules, they are uh, compounds, are broken down 
and reformed into something called cellulose or wood. And in the process, the excess oxygen is then released into the atmosphere, which of course we utilize. But it's a cycle. And what goes in comes out. So the CO2 that goes in as carbon eventually gets released back as carbon. It's really never sequestered unless you have certain events like the coal formation that would put the, uh, the wood into the ground for millennia and uh, sequester it. So wood decomposes. And when it decomposes, it goes back into what it was made from, carbon dioxide, water, and the energy the sun put into making it is then released. Now, if you look at a molecule of wood, uh, these are actually uh, two atom, two molecules of wood, and it's uh, basically cellulose, and it's something that we can't digest, but you see it's made up of three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And when we're making charcoal, we are going to be removing the hydrogen and the oxygen and leaving the carbon behind. So we all know what rotting wood is. That is the process of wood decomposing. Now, when we take that same wood and we char it through a process known as pyrolysis, pyro, of course, meaning fire, analysis meaning the changing of. When we pyrolyze wood, we are actually taking some of that carbon and putting it into a form that does not decompose unless you burn it. So charcoal can last in the soil for thousands of years because nothing will decompose it except fire. So through the process of pyrolysis, we make a break in this carbon cycle. And now instead of releasing all that carbon back into the atmosphere, now we're keeping about 25% of the charcoal in the wood. Uh, I'm sorry. 50% of the carbon in the wood is now being converted into charcoal, which we can use for a multitude of uses. Okay, and this is charcoal. This is wood that has been heated in the absence or low oxygen environment. The hydrogen, the oxygen have been driven off and you're left with almost pure carbon. And the structure of the wood that we saw in the earlier pictures, all those pores are still present in this charcoal. Matter of fact, I can often take a piece of charcoal that's been out in the woods for 200 years, look at it and tell you what species of wood it came from. Now, I'm mentioning charcoal, biochar, I flip it around a lot. Typically charcoal is the term used when the material is utilized as a fuel. If you are going to put it into the soil, a new term coined you know, about 20 years ago uh, is biochar. And underline that word investment. It's not a one-time thing. It is a investment that will last for thousands of years. Now, I've been using charcoal for, oh, 30 years. I do blacksmithing, forging, metal uh, casting and such. So I looked on it as a fuel, of course, cooking and everything. But around 2004, someone gave me an article about these uh, soils down in the Amazon River Basin. And it's called Terra Preta, which is Portuguese for dark earth or black earth. And they've been discovered uh, back in the late 1800s, but more and more research has been done on them because even today they find these patches of black soil are very rich in nutrients and much more productive than the surrounding jungle soil, which is, of course, highly leached because of all the uh, tropical rains. So nutrients don't stay in the soil. And over the decades, a lot of argument about it, but they're finally realizing that this stuff was engineered. It was designed by the people in the Amazon that uh, incorporated charcoal in with their waste and then that was carried to the field where over the decades it was added. And today you can go into some of these. This is a soil pit in Terra Preta. And you can see the uh, broken pieces of pottery, 
charcoal. They found bones in there. Uh, and what I surmise is in the making of the charcoal, these people produced pottery, which was then used in their village. All of their waste went into the pot and it was dusted with charcoal. And then that cut down the odor, cut down the flies. And every time they put in a deposit of either human manure or waste products from the kitchen, uh, they dusted with charcoal until the pot was full. Then those were taken out to the field, broken, and the soil, the, the uh, charcoal-laden nutrients were then incorporated in the soil. And over thousands of years, you have these large profiles built where people had lived literally very sustainably for thousands of years. Um, let me back up here a second. Uh, when I read that article about the Terra Preta, a light bulb went on in my head and I reflected on the uh, very fertile black prairie soils we have here in the, in the United States. And of course, fires are very prevalent in a grass system. And then it hit me that, you know, all that burning grass does produce a little bits of charcoal. So over thousands and thousands of years of those prairies burning, little bits of charcoal were incorporated in soil. And today we have these very rich black soils in our American uh, prairies. Um, and with that, I started to use charcoal in my garden. And I've been looking at articles ever since then. And the body of work on the use of charcoal biochar in soil is almost growing exponentially since I started delving into this back a little over 10 years ago. Okay. So when you look at soil, it has chemical properties, it has physical properties and biological properties. And charcoal added to those soils affects those properties. So when we look at chemical properties, these are some of the changes it makes. Charcoal has ash in it, maybe 2%. It depends on how much bark was present with the material from which you made your charcoal. The more bark, of course, the higher the ash content, because wood by itself has very little ash. Most of the ash is in the bark. And the ash uh, produces carbonates, which raise the pH of soil. Things like potassium carbonate, calcium carbonate, uh, potassium uh, and phosphorus. So it can temporarily increase the pH of soil. Now, in most of PA, we lime soil. So this is actually a benefit. Now the pH is, I have there temporary because there is not a lot of uh, buffering in the ash because the ash component of charcoal is so low. Um, it increases the cation anion exchange capability of the soil. This is huge. Cations, anions, such as nitrates, ammonia, potassium, calcium. These are all required by plants. And the charcoal has an affinity for binding these cations, anions, and holding them within their matrix through what's called van der Waal forces. These attractions are not a chemical bond. They are not a strong covalent bond or ionic bond. They're more of a weak bond but they're still important because they can hold these nutrients in place for the plants to utilize later. Uh, they have a huge surface area. And these surface areas are good at absorbing organic and ionic compounds. So these are some of the chemical properties in the soil. Uh, this just a little diagram. This is from an experiment. Uh, that illustrates a plant growing in a growing medium with nitrogen, these would be nitrate ions, present in the soil, NO3. And on the left in the control, you can see after a certain period of time, uh, the nitrates levels dropped to 100 milligrams per liter, and they had moved through the soil profile and were found down lower. Because nitrate is an extremely mobile uh, ion and uh, easily washed away from uh, the root zone through you know, rain events and such. However, 
look to the right where the biochar was added. The, because it's able to hold that nitrate ion within its matrix and hold it there until the plant can use it, uh, it keeps the nitrate more in the root zone of the plant in the upper, uh, upper quadrant of the soil. So you have less leaching. Uh, and this just illustrates, this is a barrel of biochar that I have. And uh, right there you see a resistance meter. And when the terminals are not touching, it registers one. Now the better conductivity a material has, when you touch the wires to it, it'll go to zero. So if I put a copper wire between the red and the black terminals, it would register zero. Well, I stuck one end in the barrel of biochar and I put the other end about a foot away from it. And you can see the ability of electrons to move between those two points is 0 0.004. It's darn close to one. And what this illustrates is the ability of biochar to move electrons uh, from one uh, particle to another. And this is important because all of physical life on Earth uh, requires electricity. I mean, your basic atom of hydrogen is a neutron, proton, and electron. So electrons are extremely important, and how they move around to the soil is extremely important for soil health. Okay, physical properties. This is where uh, charcoal also does a lot. Now, when you look at um, physical properties of soil, you have texture. You've got sandy soils, silt soils, clay soils. When you add charcoal or as biochar to these soils, it changes things because biochar is extremely lightweight, uh, very little density. And so therefore it reduces soil density. So if you have a heavy soil like clay soils, biochar will really improve it. It will separate the clay particles and one experiment I did, I, I have some clay I just dug up and I added 10% by volume of charcoal. It's amazing. The clay doesn't pack together anymore. It really changes things. So this allows uh, increased porosity because of all the pore space that is still present in the charcoal after you make it. Uh, it allows air to move through the soil profile. Of course, air, oxygen being necessary for plant root growth. Uh, it increases the infiltration of the water because all these pores are there. When you have clay platelets stuck together and they dry out and gets bone dry, it's very hard for water to work its way back in there. With the charcoal, that is uh, helped immensely because charcoal is much like a sponge, quick to absorb water. So infiltration goes quickly, but it retains the water. In all those pores, it's like capillary action, and it holds the water within those pores, but then it will release it to the surrounding soil if the plant roots need it. So charcoal can help with droughty soils and in drought conditions. And then finally, it has a, a, a place that's physically, there are pores there which can host sites for microbes to hang out, bacteria, nematodes, uh, bits of fungi, can then repopulate the soil from these uh, little condos, we call it. Okay, there's some of the physical properties. And then this is just an illustration, uh, two quart jars here. The one on the left is filled with ground charcoal. The one on the right was filled with water. I took the water from the jar on the right and started adding it to the charcoal filled quart jar. And initially, over half of the water went in. Then over the next two days, I kept adding a little more as the water in the charcoal uh, filled the pores. This was bone dry charcoal, so it, it took a little while for the, the pores to, uh, you know, capillary action to pull water in. But at the end of about two days, what you see in the jar on the right is the water that I could not add any more to the charcoal. Uh, filled jar. And that represents the actual physical space occupied by the charcoal 
in the jar on the left. So you see there's a lot of pore space in this charcoal when you use this biochar. Now, this is biochar in the soil can alter the biological properties and this is minimal. Depending on how the charcoal is made, there may be some aromatic uh, compounds that are produced, some terpenes that may be utilized by some soil, fauna, or flora. Uh, but that depends on how the charcoal is made. And charcoal biochar should really not be looked on as a source of food for the soil. It's not a fertilizer. It's inert, but it and it has very low food value. So this is minimal as far as altering the biological properties. Okay, so when we add biochar to the soil, these are some of the uh, things we can observe. Uh, suppressed methane emission. The charcoal absorbs methane gas, and then it holds it while bacteria or protozoan, whoever, will digest the methane and use it for their energy source. It reduces nitrous oxide emissions uh, because it holds the nitrates. They don't uh, degrade and make nitrous oxide. It holds it in the soil. Reduces leaching of nutrients. Because charcoal can hold ions, cations, you have rain events. Like right now, it's winter here in Pennsylvania. Uh, we just had some rain here over the last weekend. That rain will wash nitrates out of the soil profile because the plants are not holding it there. They aren't using it. They're dormant. But if there was charcoal in the soil, it would hold them there. Therefore, it would reduce the amount of fertilizer you need on a yearly basis because it's holding these nutrients in the zone where the plant needs them instead of letting them either volatilize out or leach out. Uh, somewhat reduces soil ac acidity because it can raise the pH, but like I mentioned, this is a minor improvement because the buffering capability of charcoal is based on the ash content, which is very minimal. It can store carbon for a long time. And you saw that picture of Terra Preta, that some of the soil, that charcoal on the bottom was there a thousand years ago or more, very long lasted. So it can be used as a source of carbon sequestration. And for about every pound of ch carbon charcoal you put in the soil is about three pounds of CO2, carbon dioxide, out of the atmosphere. Some other benefits. It increases your soil aggregation because the fungi seem to like the charcoal. And I, I, this past fall, I dug up some soil from my garden. I've been putting charcoal in there for probably at least eight years. And I took this big clump of soil and I put it in a bucket of water expecting it to just kind of dissolve. It didn't. Two weeks later, the water was not muddy. That clump of soil was all intact. And this was a function of the gomulin and all the glues that the bacteria excrete. It really increases your soil aggregation. Uh, the soil handling characteristics, you saw how porous the charcoal is. So big rain events tend to go into the soil instead of running off. It increases the layers of uh, your availability of other ions, cations in the soil. Now, phosphorus doesn't move very much, but uh, potassium can. Uh, because it's porous, it increases the respiration of the microbe. Uh, it makes it a more healthy environment for them, so that it tends to increase the microbial biomass. Even the fungal biomass increases. Now, I already mentioned about the cation ion exchange. just increases a lot. Um, toxicity, it, it can bind up some metals, such as aluminum. And I'll show you a little later about zinc. Um, we already mentioned the soil aggregation, prove water capabilities. I already mentioned that one. And it seems to stimulate uh, other processes in the soil, like the fixation of nitrogen in legumes. I am a skeptic. And 
as long as I've been doing this biochar charcoal interest, I've always been on the lookout for negative uses of charcoal in the soil. And quite honestly, I have not found them. The only negative that I can find is when you put raw charcoal into the soil before it has been either moistened or loaded with nutrients. And they'll tend to take it from the plant. Other than that, I have not found any negatives. I like to look on charcoal as a battery. It's a battery that gets charged, charged with water, charged with nutrients, and then these can be discharged as the plants need them or the microflora fauna in the soil need them. So I like to look on this biochar as a battery in and out. Now, when you're adding charcoal or biochar to the soil, I already mentioned these, that you need to do a few things. One is make sure you load it up with some sort of nutrient-rich material. Charge it up. And this is easy in an animal operation. I'll show you that a little bit later. And it has some benefits to it. Uh, the size is small. Kernel corn or smaller, even down to dust, is great. The dust I added to the, uh, the clay soil really made a difference because it could work its way between the plates of the clay. So being too small is not a problem. Damp. Uh, this reduced the dust amount. And if you apply it to a field, you don't want to put dry charcoal on a field. The wind will just carry it away. So prime it, grind it, dampen it. And this is just a uh, real quick show you. This is a, a Gravely tractor. Uh, on the picture on the right is a grinder. It's basically like a big pepper mill. And there's a hopper that goes on top of it. And I use that to grind my charcoal. The, the stuff you saw in that barrel with the electric meter, that was ground on this machine. And as a side note, the picture on the left shows a charcoal gasifier mounted on that same tractor. So that I am actually burning charcoal in that milk can to run to make carbon monoxide, which runs the engine, which then runs my charcoal grinder. Now, this is an experiment I started back in 2013, because uh, people always ask, well, how much charcoal should you add? And so on the left is some soil I dug up from uh, near my garden. It's not garden soil. This is from out in an old pasture. And it's called the control. I took that same soil. I added 5% by volume of charcoal. Now this is raw charcoal. This is a no-no. I put raw charcoal in there, which had no nutrients, no moisture or anything. Uh, but I figured beans are a legume, so they can pull nitrogen from the air. So I'm not too worried about fertilizing. The third uh, bucket over, I doubled the amount of biochar in it to 10% by volume. The next one, I doubled again to 20% by volume. The uh, fifth bucket was 40% uh, by volume of charcoal. The 60% was the same soil in the control. And then just on a whim, I figured I'm going to try 80% charcoal. And that's the last bucket on the right. I honestly thought when I planted four beans in each pot that the 80% charcoal would not even grow. Well, lo and behold, it did. You can see it's pretty anemic. Uh, there's no very little nutrients with whatever's in that 20% of soil, which is in the first pot, is all the nutrients it had. Uh, but when I uh, dried the beans at the end of the season and weighed them, basically the 80% charcoal produced as much weight as the control. But the important part here is to see the 5-10% is a good starting point for how much biochar should I add to my soil. And my hypothesis was that as that 80% pot was exposed to the elements, as that biochar got charged with uh, nitrates from rainfall, from snowfall, uh, that that would improve. And here we are. This is 2015 results three years later. And you can see there is an improvement in the 80%. But the 5, 10, 20% all kind of seem about the same. And then last year, and I haven't crunched any numbers in the past two years, but this was taken last July. And you can see uh, a marked difference 
in the look of the plants based on how much biochar was in there. And I have not added any fertilizer. These have been sitting out all winter. So does biochar help? And I say absolutely. Okay. I mentioned charcoal being charged. And there's several ways of doing it. One soaking it in some tea. This is a way I uh, initially started, actually still doing it this way, is to just use animals. In this case, this is a mini pony. I threw the charcoal in his stall, and he then stamps on it, grinds it into manure, urinates on it. Uh, and I've been doing this now for at least six years. And when I started doing it, about a week later, I'd said, I don't smell the barnyard odors that I used to. So I noticed that I'm, I'm kind of slow sometimes. So it took about a week. And I noticed the change in the odor in the barn. And then the following week, it finally hit me. Where are the flies? Because, you know, barns have a lot of flies. In this case, the flies pretty much are gone. They aren't an issue. We used to hang fly paper in the barn. So evidently, the dryness of the charcoal dries out the manure, sucks up the nutrients, and makes it more of a hostile environment for fly to lay their larvae. So this is something that could have uh, implications for more uh, animal operations. I've also been doing a lot of reading about how charcoal uh, affects other things, and one of them is cattle. And a lot of this came from some from Europe. And more recently, I got some information from Australia. But this is, happens to be a farmer in uh, Jefferson County, Pennsylvania, who raises, he does rotational grazing. And these cattle come in on a tractor trailer. Uh, they're unloaded. Uh, they're bought at auction. So there are all sorts of health, maybe health issues and such, different, you know, some may be in good shape and some may be poor shape, more sickly. But he's paid to graze these animals until October when the truck comes back. They're loaded on, and then he gets paid for the weight they gain during the summer. And what he does is move them every day into a new paddock of fresh grass. He supplies them with water and minerals. Now, on his property was this woodlot, and he was doing a timber stand improvement. And I looked around at that because I was brought there as a forester to look at his timber stand improvement. I says, my gracious, this would make great wood for charcoal. And he told, asked me, you know, well, what do I do with the charcoal? And I said, well, you could sell it as barbecue fuel. Uh, but I've read this article about using charcoal for cattle and how it helps their health. Well, this guy's kind of progressive kind of innovative and kind of looking for new ideas. He took that, he made his wood into charcoal, and he dumped it into each paddock as the cattle were grazing. So he'd make, he'd move the cattle, he'd go make a batch of charcoal, and then he'd dump it in the next paddock. The next day, the cattle moved to the next paddock. And what he observed was almost immediately the cattle eating as much mineral, and they ate charcoal. It's free choice. Nothing's being forced on them. So they ate this charcoal by choice. And I've heard this from other uh, people that when they do a, a brush burn in a field, this cattle seem to go over there and eat the charcoal. I've even heard of deer eating it in uh, prescribed burns on state forest land. So this is mostly from a study down in Australia where a, a cattle rancher started to use charcoal, biochar, in his cattle operation. He was specifically interested in getting the charcoal into the soil. But what he noticed was, that, yeah, the cattle would eat it. He mixed it with molasses, so that, of course, it was tasty. But he also noticed some of these other results, like the legumes increased in his fields, pastures, where the grasses started to decrease. He used to fertilize his fields. Now he no longer does that. And this would be tied with the charcoal holding nutrients in the soil, making them available for plants when they need it. Nitrous oxide emissions. 
from the manure were decreased. Well, it only makes sense because the charcoal is holding those, so they can't be decomposed. And these were tested by uh, some University of New South Wales or something down there. I, I have the paper. If anyone's interested in it, I can make it available to them. Methane emissions from cattle. We all heard about how methane from cattle are warming the globe, but methane is readily absorbed by charcoal. So that it can then be passed through the animal, go to the soil where microbes can then digest that methane. Interesting, he mentioned that charcoal provided a bulking agent and that the cattle started to eat less grass. And his takeaway was, the cattle need a certain amount of bulk. It doesn't have to be good grass, but they need something. And the charcoal seemed to provide this. And he noticed the health of the pasture increased. And he noticed that dung beetles in particular were taking the charcoal from the dung piles and moving it underground as they took the manure down. And this, this biochar was actually being put down into the soil profile about, I think he said about, it said 600 millimeters, I don't know, a foot or so. And then interesting, uh, when cattle get very hot, they pant. And what I understand of this is you get ammonia or urea buildup in their rumen, and they have to get rid of it, and they <sighs> pant when it gets really hot. If charcoal was a part of their uh, the makeup of the room and, you know, in their food, then that would absorb some of that nitrogen, that ammonia, that urea, hold it in there so it wouldn't cause these animals to pant, maybe not as much, and then the charcoal would carry that out of their manure. And then that would be a fertilizer available for when the plants needed it. Now, I already mentioned about the mineral supplements being decreased by a third uh, when the animals were given choice of uh, charcoal. And then this, uh, as grazer also noticed how the cattle health increased, the coaching, the filled out bodies, uh, the scours that the cattle had, uh, the, the brightness of their eyes all seemed to improve with the addition when cattle could access charcoal. So I'm thinking, this is big. This really needs looked at more because uh, I think it can go a long way to helping create more sustainable grazing systems. Okay, uh, concentrated uh, farm uh, animal uh, feeding operations. These happen to be, I believe they're turkeys. I just got this off the internet just to show something. But you can imagine turkeys doing what they do. The ammonia level in this barn has to be horrendous. And therefore, they need a lot of ventilation, a lot of fans, moving a lot of air quickly so that the birds don't basically suffocate in their own ammonia. What about using charcoal to absorb that ammonia? Why don't we use charcoal in their bedding? Even feeding charcoal at one half to one percent of their feed has shown to be beneficial in reducing uh, methane, or I'm sorry, uh, ammonia emissions. And then uh, we're all familiar with, you know, lagoons. I, I think this lagoon's covered with a tarp, but you guys get the picture. Uh, they can be quite odiferous. Why not use biochar, charcoal, that can be used to hold these nutrients in the matrix of the charcoal, to hold the odor-causing bacteria and the odors actually that are created, the ammonia, and then take that, land apply it, where the charcoal will hold those nutrients in the soil profile to keep it from leaching into the groundwater into the bay. I'm thinking Chesapeake Bay should be using charcoal out the wazoo for all of these concentrated farm operations simply because it holds nutrients on the site and creates better soil tilth and reduces the amount of fertilizers you need. Yes, charcoal can absolutely change this. Uh, people just aren't aware of it at this point in time. And hopefully you guys, when you're done with the seminar, you'll know a little bit more about the benefits of biochar. Now I'm gonna jump here into urban planting. This is from Stockholm, Sweden, 
where they're actually using the urban wood stream to create renewable energy. And in the process, not only heating buildings, but producing charcoal. And we all know that an urban environment is extremely difficult for uh, trees. So what they've done is incorporated biochar in the planting medium around the trees instead of just putting sand or or construction debris or clay back into the soil pit where the trees have a hard time going through the compaction, they use charcoal. Increases water infiltration, increases nutrient retention, and helps tree survival immensely. It allows oxygen to get down to the root zone, which is extremely important. And this is just a picture uh, where they've incorporated rock and then between those rock matrix, those gaps are filled with yards and yards and yards of biochar. Uh, this is just a kind of like a rain garden that collects water from the, uh, the plaza and the water flows into this basin. Typically, we fill those with wood chips or bark. All of those will decompose within several years. If we use charcoal, it will be there for thousands of years doing its work, capturing the runoffs. Motor oil coming off that car will be trapped in the matrix of the charcoal. And then the flora and the fauna that lives within that uh, soil system, supported by growth in the trees, can break down those hydrocarbons into usable plant food. So this is something that is big, that is big in Stockholm. I think it should be big here in the United States because uh, leaf compost, wood chips typically are used in our rain gardens, our uh, stormwater runoff, our catchment basins, but they all rot. They go away and then you have to replenish it. I propose charcoal is the way to go. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, that we are under the MS4 regulations, which means municipal has to separate their storm sewer systems. It's a big thing, it's EPA mandated. And why aren't we looking at using biochar for this process? And the reason is because people really are not that aware of it at this point in time. This happens to be a, uh, from the Philadelphia Water Department, their green stormwater infrastructure design guidebook. And this is uh, some of the materials that they recommend as organic grass clippings, compost, shredded leaves, pine needles, all of these are great. All of them will be decomposed within a few years and be totally gone. Sand increases permeability, absolutely, but it does not absorb water. It's a rock. It only coats the surface of the, the water only coats the surface of the sand. If you used charcoal, it would permeate the pores. And charcoal is locally manufactured from renewable resources using carbon that was in the atmosphere just a few years, if not a few decades ago. Sand, on the other hand, is mined. So, um, oh, and it doesn't sequester carbon, whereas biochar would. So hopefully, some of the landscapers, the schools will start realizing the benefits of biochar for infrastructure, or green water, storm water. This is a picture from Townsend, Port Townsend in Washington state where they have a major problem with zinc runoff from a boat yard. And they're using charcoal to capture those zinc ions. This same thing could be used to capture nutrients from a runoff from a, from a, uh, a farm pad where animals concentrate, big rain events, the manure washes off. Instead of going to the settling pond or into the stream, why don't we capture it in this charcoal? And then we can use that as fertilizer in our fields. Okay, so street tree environment, let's start looking at using charcoal in there for all the benefits, water retention, oxygenation, uh, soil tilt to allow the roots to penetrate to the hard urban environment to grow better trees faster and longer lived and healthier. So the carbon cycle, 
It's going to happen whether we do anything or not. The CO2 will cycle into living organisms and back into the atmosphere. Or we can use pyrolysis to arrest some of that carbon and use it for all of these benefits that we absolutely can use to create a more sustainable system. So, biochar in the soil. It's a way to capture carbon. It's a way to reduce nitrate soil emissions. It's a way to reduce methane emissions. It can create energy that's carbon negative because we can capture some of the energy from making the charcoal and use it for other things. It can reduce odors. I already mentioned my horse stall. It would help in any chicken operation, pig, even human. So under the ground, we see where biochar can decrease nutrient runoff. It holds the stuff in the soil matrix, so it doesn't run off. It increases your soil carbon, increases soil fertility, increases soil tilt. There really, I have not found any negatives. Now, I throw the slide in here. I don't know who my audience is. I like to plant seeds. Uh, this is my composting toilet I use in my shop using charcoal as the medium to control the odor. And then that is composted. Over time, that compost can then be land applied and those nutrients can be cycled. Right now we are using mostly fossil fuel derived energy and suffice to say that is a finite supply. Uh, charcoal can also be used to power electric motors, in this case, a little electric generator is being powered by the charcoal in that larger device. Uh, this is a, a replica of a, a green roof. And most green roofs are built using extruded uh, either volcanic material or expanded clay as the base medium on which the plants grow. I maintain we should be looking at using charcoal instead of using clay because clay is mined. It has to be transported long distance. Charcoal, on the other hand, is lightweight. It is locally sourced. It is carbon negative. It is carbon sequestering. It holds the water. It holds the nutrients. We should be looking at using charcoal as a substrate for green roofs. Okay, I've been told I'm kind of crazy and I will admit I, I like charcoal and I like exploring all the different uses. This happens to be powdered charcoal on my toothbrush. Yes, it does leave your teeth black until you rinse. Charcoal does not stain, it absorbs materials. And there are now more and more products being made using charcoal. This is a drink. Uh, it's for, it contains maple syrup, but charcoal as a, quote, detoxifying agent. Articles are appearing more about charcoal, go-to remedy. We've long known that activated charcoal in the emergency room was good at absorbing certain types of poisons. Uh, my wife used to work in the ICU, and she hates charcoal because she's had patients where they've administered this and then of course they throw up and it does make a mess black but it has its benefits and lately I've seen more and more ads of using charcoal for beauty products why aren't we using charcoal for our food storage this is a, my potato bin and starting several years ago I started to lay down a layer of charcoal and then put my uh, crop, in this case potatoes, or could be corn, onions, on top of it. Should any of these potatoes start to rot, the odor will be absorbed by the charcoal. The charcoal helps regulate the moisture content in there. So it helps preserve the wood, or the, uh, the food crop, whether it be apples or, or uh, in this case, uh, potatoes. Okay, guys, we're running out of time. I'm gonna go through this real quickly. The benefits of charcoal are tremendous. How do you make it? It's very easy to make in your backyard. 
This is, happens to be some wood. I air dry for a year. Dry wood is paramount for making charcoal uh, efficiently. So this is just a drum I fill with wood. And in this case, it's a top lit up draft called T-LUD. The fire is lit on the top. The fire burns down the barrel. And there are holes around the perimeter at the base. So as the fire gets going, uh, what you don't see is the afterburner, which is on top of this. The afterburner is just another barrel the same size, and it concentrates the smoke and burns it off. So this is a smoke-free way of making charcoal. Now, you see smoke there because I just lit the fire. I stepped back, but in five minutes, that will all be cleared up. And as the wood progresses, it takes about three hours to do. Uh, this is a 55-gallon barrel. And when the fire comes to the base where these holes are, it's come down to where the oxygen's burning or causing the charcoal to burn. Now it's time to put it out. And if I look inside, this is the view, about one quarter of the wood uh, by weight will be turned into charcoal. So that's your return. Of course, if I don't shut it down, I'll be left with nothing but ash. But by controlling the air, shutting off the air to the base, the fire goes out and you're left with charcoal. Uh, another way of making it, this is a, uh, it's called pyramid kiln. This is, could be a backyard fire pit. But basically you light a fire in there, you add the wood. As the fire burns, the charcoal falls to the bottom. You keep adding fresh wood on top. That intercepts the oxygen getting to the bottom and the charcoal accumulates. And you end up with a batch of charcoal. Other ways, uh, these are just different methods I make. One's a 500-gallon tank cut in half, and the other is just a long tank cut lengthwise. The idea is the charcoal goes to the bottom. As you add wood on top, it intercepts the oxygen, and the thing fills with charcoal. Then you have to use water and shovel the charcoal out and into an airtight drum to let it cool down. And then there are other ex more expensive ways. Uh, this is an Exeter kiln. He's loading the interior kiln and a fire will be built underneath that. As the wood gets to about 500 degrees, it will self ignite and the gases given off will then be redirected to keep the process going. This is called the indirect method. Just go to YouTube, type in making charcoal and you will be bombarded with a multitude of ways. Some simple, some very complex. So I am going to stop here and leave you with the statement. Charcoal has a bright future for a truly sustainable type of living. So I'll open up to questions. Terry, thank you so much. I learned a ton about uh, charcoal and biochar. I, it sounds like I am reverberating. Is that true right now? Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, it's better. Okay. Um, yeah, that was fascinating, and you definitely opened my mind to some different opportunities for utilizing biochar. One of the things that kept running through my mind, even before, I think it was last night I first thought about this, um, but while you were speaking, for me was, you know, we hear a lot about carbon neutral cities and carbon neutral um, um, industries, and how do you see biochar playing a role um, either on a regional or state level um, in getting closer to that carbon neutral ideal? Oh boy. First of all, we have to stop using fossil fuel. Now wrap your head around that for a second and you see what a tremendous amount of work we have to do. Even though we may use a lot of carbon negative or carbon neutral stuff, we're still throwing so much CO2 two in the atmosphere through the use of fossil fuel, that what we do with this, uh, it, with uh, carbon neutral is, is so minuscule. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I hate to be a downer about this, but I've, I've been looking at this for a decade now, and without dropping our use of fossil fuel, we, we can't do it. And. Mm -hmm. We aren't going <laughs> to, but on your own personal use, for instance, my charcoal commode, I'm not pumping water. I'm not using electricity to pump water to flush a commode. 
to run the piping, to bring the water to my house, the piping to take it to a sewage treatment plant, the, the energy to treat that sewage, the energy to then take that sewage and put it into a landfill where it's then buried. So on your own way, you can be more carbon neutral, more carbon negative. But as a global system, I, I don't have much. I'm sorry. Uh, never mind. I'm being too negative here. No, no, anyway. that's okay. That's okay, Gary. You know, it's obviously um, getting off of the fossil fuel addiction is going to be at least a generational, if not several generational, um, process. Yes. And so, in in the in our lifetimes, you know, I think what I keep coming back to is whatever I can change in my own personal life is really uh, a great start. Um, yeah, that's, so that's thank where you we for the attempt to, to answer that huge, large, big picture, 30,000 level or foot level uh, question that I posed there. Um, okay, so I do have a couple questions from the audience. Um, and Kyle, I noticed that you have your hand raised. Um, if you could ask a question in the question box, um, that would be the easiest way for us to get to you because I can't actually turn on your mic or anything like that. Okay, so the first question is, are there many successful biochar businesses in the Mid-Atlantic? Not that I am aware of. There's a few on the Pacific Coast. There's a few in the interior. Missouri is traditionally the, has been traditionally making charcoal for the charcoal uh, grilling industry. So there is a fair amount of make manufacturers there. And that's the conundrum here. I'm promoting charcoal and all these great benefits, but there's not many people making it. But I'll phrase that with the preposition yet. Because I know several people are looking at it as a serious business model. Uh, so it's a chicken and the egg type of thing. Um, but right now, I don't know of any manufacturers of large quantities of biochar here in the Mid-Atlantic okay. yet. Great. Um, let's see. Next question. Oops. Um, does the type of wood matter, hardwood or softwood? Ah. Matt, yeah. Okay. Excellent question. It depends whether you're using it as a fuel or as biochar. As a fuel, the denser the wood, the heavier the wood, the better the fuel. For instance, running the, the engine, I want hardwood charcoal. In the ground, biochar, it doesn't matter. I use mostly pine, aspen, the lightweight woods are ideal for biochar. Sure, you can make them out of hardwood, but it doesn't matter if you're going to put it in the soil, whether it's hardwood or softwood. Um, I just wanted to make you folks aware, I'm going to share on the question box, um, that there is a biochar charcoal production for power and fertility um, field day at the PASA conference coming up. And I believe that is next week sometime. If yeah. anybody, yeah. Do you know the dates of that exactly? Um, um, uh, yeah, it's next week. But, you know, I don't, I think that's a pre-conference tour. Okay. Uh, so you have to go to PASA uh, con and look on the conference and uh, get the information there. www.pasafarming.org. Correct. Now, I will be there at that event, although I will not be involved with this particular uh, event. I'll be at the PASA event with the Bureau of Forestry Display. So if any right, of you so are there. Everybody go over and say hey to Gary and come up with more questions to ask him on that day about forestry and biochar. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Gary, one more that I have so far. With making biochar, could you also produce hydrogen? I do not know the answer to that. Hydrogen is a product that's given off. When you make the biochar, the hydrogen in the wood is converted to water vapor so can you make hydrogen from water vapor absolutely uh can you use a catalyst to i i don't know of anyone doing that 
So I'll just, it doesn't sound very doable to me. Okay. Um, great. But who knows what could happen in the future? You know, all yeah. these great minds thinking and dreaming yeah. and creating. We could do anything. Yeah. Now, there is a byproduct that you can make from charcoal called wood vinegar, which is a mixture of wood acetate, wood vinegar, and wood methanol, which is you know, wood, wood alcohol. That can be condensed out of the smoke given off as you're making the charcoal. And that is a very interesting, it's a whole suite of different, there's a soup of different chemicals. There are terpenes, there's uh, oh, phenols, a bunch of stuff. But if you put it on a different concentrations on plants, it can either enhance their growth, enhance, uh, uh, actually it can kill the plant if you put it on strong enough. Uh, it can control certain bugs and it seems to be very detrimental on nematodes in the soil. So this is just research uh, that I've read mostly overseas. There's nothing domestic that I've read on uh, wood vinegar yet, but it's being looked at. I know in Japan has a long history of use of wood vinegar, uh, which was pretty robust until World War II. After that, they switched mostly to you know, manufactured chemicals and it got away from wood vinegar, but they're going back and readdressing it. And there's some studies coming out of Japan. So that's something that could be looked at and is a byproduct of the production of charcoal. Great. Um, let's see here. This one says, it's talking about uh, poultry litter and that mm -hmm. there are lots of uh, poultry barns in the center of the state says how viable is poultry litter for charcoal i'm thinking um flip that around how viable is charcoal for poultry litter okay there are entities that are make taking the poultry litter and they're making it into charcoal biochar personally i would rather see that chicken manure being incorporated into charcoal instead of burnt um I, I think it has a higher value as a nitrogen fertilizer than as a charcoal. Because let's face it, a lot of the chicken manure is loaded with nitrogen. And when you char it, you're driving some of that off. So basically you're throwing away some of your fertilizer ability of that poultry biochar. Now, with that said, some people are making it into biochar and using it. I don't know much about how that works and how it affects the soil. Because poultry biochar doesn't have the, the, uh, the pore space that wood charcoal does. So that's the best I can do with that question. That's right, yeah. Well, thank you, Gary, for tackling all of those uh, thoughtful and insightful questions. Um, I think I am going to close it up now since we have reached our time. But uh, there's a question here. Will the PowerPoint pres presentation be available after the webinar? Oh, we got two more questions. Okay, you guys. Um, I'm going to say that, yes, it will be available. It's going to be on the Capital RCD website, and that's www.capitalrcd.org. Um, and then the next question, and this will be our last question, any information of how biochar can be studied within the field of magnetohydrodynamics? This is from, this question is from Kyle. He's the same one that asked about it. <laughs> okay. Well, Kyle, I think you are onto something and maybe you know more about what you're talking about definitely than I do. Um, Gary, you wanna tackle that? Yes, I'll tackle that. Uh, Kyle, I'm gonna say, that is going to need some looking into. So, and I know who Kyle is, so uh, we, we can uh, tackle that together and uh, explore that possible option. Because right now I have no, no answer for that. Great. Google it. Google it, thank you. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Carl Dupolt who um, sent in all of those uh, links that I've been sharing uh, throughout the present, the last 10 minutes of the question answer period. So thanks, Carl, for doing that 
side research while we were do running this webinar. And um, everyone have a really great day and a great rest of your week. And Gary, thank you again for um, sharing your knowledge and experience with all of us today. It was invaluable. And look forward okay. to talking to you soon. Okay, you're welcome and thanks. Thanks all for listening and go make some charcoal and use it. It's great stuff. Will do. Take care, okay. everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.